so in this episode of what's going on with shipping i'm joined today by a celebrity in his own right uh by captain andy jones the menorcan mullet himself so andy started a youtube page back in july of 2020 and very much like my own circumstance where i started a youtube page because of a maritime event cat mandy started one himself but his took place literally in his backyard and that's the wreck of the golden ray down in brunswick georgia so cat mandy welcome to what's going on with shipping i'm so happy to have you on board Doc, it's great to be on here with the, with your viewers and be able to talk a little bit about what's happened here. Love to do it. Anytime I get an opportunity to talk about it, I want to do it. Well, it, it's it's first off, it's a terrible tragedy, and I hate that you know we're we're getting together for this, but I think it's really important for because one of the things I think you have done with your YouTube page. Let me be clear: is is I'm a maritime historian. I went to maritime college. Is I think you've documented probably one of the best salvage operations. At, ever seen i mean you've got documentation you've got videos this is literally a master class in salvage and we'll talk about whether it's a good salvage or bad salvage down the road but but you did and i think that's one of the things that's really amazing about it so before we get going i i just want to take a moment and have you introduce yourself <clears throat> you have over ten thousand subscribers i think ten point three thousand subscribers so let me tell you when we started this thing i originally thought i might have 25 or maybe 50 viewers that might subscribe <laughs> to the channel same thing from the island and just want to want to take a look and see kind of what was going on out, out at the site because uh there was so much i don't want to use the word secrecy but i have used manhattan like project that took place in the sound there was uh, everybody that was that was brought in to do the job had to sign uh, a disclosure agreement so there really wasn't a lot of information except what was coming out from uh, the unified command, which consisted of the contractors and the Coast Guard and the state of Georgia. And to be honest with you, that information only came maybe once a week or once every 10 days. And we just did not think that was sufficient, given the, gra the, the gravity of the, of the, of the project. And so I thought it'd be neat to go out and, and start doing and, and when I started, I started with my iPhone. I was shooting video with my iPhone. That's how I got started with this thing. And I uh, started, started doing that and putting it up. And all of a sudden, you know, I started getting a, kind of a worldwide audience, people really interested in this operation. And, you know, originally when the accident happened, there was a good bit of press because there were four crew members um, that were trapped down inside the ship. And for a couple of days, they had some national news that kind of covered the story. But after, after they, they got the, uh, the guys safely out of the ship, it kind of went to the wayside. You really didn't hear any more about the Golden Ray. And so we thought it was, was important to kind of get it out. Again, wanted to maybe be able to show people what was going on. And the historical factor of it kind of played in a little bit as well, being able to you know maybe one day go back and look and, hey, this is what happened on the St. Simon Sound. As the, prog as the project began to unfold and we start to really start to see things, we really got to see some of the nasty side of uh, ship salvage um, when it happens really close to beaches and uh, into the estuaries. And we were out there and really, really got firsthand, firsthand saw just, just how ugly it can be. Well, and I want to jump into that because, again, I think your following is amazing. Again, over three million, nearly three million views before. And I got to say, you have a loyal following. I did a video early on when the fire broke out, uh, the most recent fire, the large one that happened. And uh, I, I made a mistake. I, I'm not human. I made a mistake. I said the wrong island or something off there. And man, the Menorcan mullet fans came out in force and said, listen, you're delving into Cat Mandy's territory. You need to let him, the expert, handle it. So you you have a loyal following, but for sure. But first off, let, let's talk about the area you're in because because it is a beautiful. Area. I've been down to Brunswick. I've been in you know Jekyll Island, St. Simon Sound, and everything. Talk a little bit about the area you're in because you've been there a long time. Well, it's kind of a unique unique place. And if you look on the east coast of the United States, we're the westernmost coastal point on that map. If if, if you look, they call it the Georgia Bight. And if you look down on the East Coast, the westernmost point, if you put a pin right there, you're going to put it right on the top of where the Golden Ray turned over. We're right down in there. And some dynamics of the area, uh, we, we, we have the, the St. Simon Sound, which kind of uh, 
brings all this water when we have a tidal change and that happens twice a day in from the ocean and it's kind of disperses it back through Brunswick behind Jekyll Island back through uh, the marsh area in St. Simons and then up a couple rivers that kind of feed in the into the area so we've got a tremendous uh, amount of uh, a flow in and out of an estuary. Our water here is brackish because we do have a lot of, of freshwater influence in here, but we also have a lot of silt. Uh, the water, if, if you go into the beach and maybe get down uh, down to your knees, you're not going to be able to see your feet. Our water is really rich with uh, marsh material, marsh silt. Um, of course, that is one of the essential parts of, of our estuary as far as being a, a breeding ground for you know, the, the, the basic building blocks for the biology of the oceans. And it all, you know, this area is kind of unique and there's not a lot of this marsh area that is that makes up the East Coast. So it's, it's a really special area. It, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Been down there a few times and I really recommend it. That's why when it happened, I knew it was going to be such a tragedy for, for this to happen in that area. Brunswick itself, uh, I mean, it's a major port. People don't think about Brunswick as, as being a major port. We tend to think about Jacksonville. We tend to think about uh, Virginia, Savannah. We think about New, New York, New Jersey. But Brunswick in itself is a major car port. I mean, one of the things you see in there are vessels much like Golden Ray coming in there. So I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about, you know, the traffic in and out of Brunswick and, and how well, what important we've seen, this is. Yeah, what we've seen, uh, because, because of Brunswick's location, and we're right on the corridor of the I-95 interstate, as well as uh, just south and north of us, I-10 and I-16. It gives uh, uh, the ability to, to, to move product out through the country very easily for the port. And uh, it has turned into a major car uh, hub for shipping not only cars, but uh, heavy equipment, agricultural equipment. Uh, when you go over and look at the port from the water, you, you actually see boats that are on trailers that are being transported. Anything you can imagine that rolls on or rolls off or has that capability off of a ship, you're going to find over in the Port of Brunswick to be moved to different locations uh, throughout the world. And it, it's, it's, the port itself has continually uh, expanded in the, in the roll-on, roll-off market. We don't do as much bulk shipping as we used to, there's still there. We still service some ships here, but not near uh, what we see in in the in the car in the car carrier traffic that's in and out of the sound. It, and those car carriers are really unique. Ships like the Golden Ray that we're going to be talking about. I mean, they're they're nothing but huge floating parking decks. I mean, it's the best analogy I ever have to explain the makeup of those vessels. Is just ramps on top of ramps, almost 14, 15 decks, I believe. A Golden Ray was on top of each other. And and again, unlike what a lot of people think, they're not just coming in and offloading, they're loading too. I mean, there's a lot of swap out of vehicles here because a lot of vehicles are being imported and a lot of being exported out of the port at the same time. Well, one thing we learned about, I learned about car carriers is the fragile nature of the construction of, a, of the vessels. When you look at them, they're, they're really massive, they, you know, massive looking vessels, but in that's, in looking at as compared to maybe a cruise ship or a warship, they're very fragile. And they have to be constructed that way. They don't have uh, the bulkhead construction that you might think of, of a, in a ship. It can't really be in there because of the nature of how they load and unload one. Like you said, it's a parking garage. It has to be open so that they can move that product on and off the ship in an efficient manner. And uh, they don't have a lot of that strength uh, that you might see in, a, in another, another ship, another type of ship of, of, of uh, that size doing another task. No, I have a friend who's a chief mate on a car carrier and very similar to Golden Ray, built in Korea, almost around the same time. And one of the things uh, she always talks about is when they load cars in the upper deck, uh, the, the crew quarters are on the very top deck. And before they load vehicles in that top deck, they have to go and open all the crew's doors because the ship, the, the steel is so light, it'll buckle the deck a little bit and the doors get wedged shut. And so they need to, to do it. And that's, that's the nature of these vessels. These vessels are built to a very light construction, as light as they need to be to be economical. And, and that's going to be an issue we'll talk about here with the vessels. Yeah, it's one of those things. And it certainly played into the actual salvage operation, um, you know, the light nature of the construction uh, kind of lent it to the idea of uh, the salvage. And, you know, I, I kind of question the way uh, 
this this particular route was taken, you know, after open 90 and, and with with the way uh, shipping is is conducted as far as uh, insurance and you've got to have, uh, you know, someone basically on retainer if there's an incident the port. They had that. Um, but and instead of going with that, uh, that original group, uh, it was decided to be it was allowed, I should say, to be put back out to bid. Um, and that kind of got nasty. It, it, you know, there was a lawsuit and some kind of things. That, the, the exact things that Open 90 was supposed to prevent and delays of response went by the wayside because we had to get there was a lawsuit. It was time was time was lost because of that. So I question I kind of question the way that operation took place. And um, the decision was made to, to cut it into eight pieces with anchor chain. Um, Considering now what I know now and, and its its proximity dock to uh, to the beaches and to the marshes and the amount of current that we have here, um, once you know once once they made the first cut and the front of the ship was cut off on that first cut, the genie was out of the bottle. There's no putting the toothpaste back in the tube after that started. So um, yeah, we started to see we we saw quite a bit of a product that came off the ship on a daily basis. We documented it. And uh, it was that was sad to see. Um, and I know it's very difficult to try to Monday morning quarterback the situation because you can't compare apples to oranges with the situation. But you got to wonder um, with the other plan, uh, would this thing have gone better? Would we have not have seen? You know, we, we saw quite a bit, quite a bit of problem, and we're still seeing. That. I, don't, I don't know if you guys uh, can catch some of this that's going on behind us, but they're actually out here pulling cars out of the water right now that fell during the cutting process and the separation of those those sections that are out there in the water right now and they're trying to get those picked up yeah some i i know some of your most popular videos unfortunately are those where i mean you literally see kias and hyundai's kind of flowing out of the out, out of the, the vessel when they're cutting it and everything i want to take it back a minute because, because i, I want to come back to this but i, I want to go back to the incident itself when it happened how did you find out about it what was your what was your reaction i mean you're obviously right down there and everything and, and oh well it was uh i remember it very well it was a sunday morning and uh, we got notification um that uh, and I think it was through Facebook that the uh, the ship had, had turned over and I was kind of you're kidding a, a ship has turned over in our sound um, so I went down I had the boat in the water and that's what started we we were out on the water um, you know just as the sun was coming up and got got some got some really early uh, video there was smoke just pouring out of the ship it was a fire that had started after it rolled over and uh, of course, you know, you got to think of, of, of crew and if, if there were any crew in there, uh, the amount of smoke I saw on it, I just, I just initially thought this is, this is going to turn out so bad because if there's anyone, if there's anyone trapped in there, they're, they're going to, they're going to have a real problem with the amount of smoke that's in there. Um, but they were the, the Brunswick pilot that was on there kind of sprung in the action. And let me tell you, if there's anybody associated with this project that deserves a medal, it's uh, the the pilot that was on that ship that day when it rolled over. He he quickly got the the tugboats back from the Port of Brunswick. You know we have service tugs that that take the ships from the bridge going into the Port of Brunswick, and they'll either take them to the berth or to pull them back away from berth, and they escort them out to the bridge, and then they're kind of on their own after they leave there with the pilot. The pilot notified them. They got those tugs out there, and they were able to push the Golden Ray back up against that south bar. And that not only did it leave the channel open, but it also probably saved the lives of those four crew members that were trapped down inside that ship by getting it up on that shallow bank. Yeah, I mean, that role was was pretty severe, pretty quick. And, you know, reading the NTSB report on it, you know, when he took that hard right to come out of uh, out, out of the Port of Brunswick, head into St. Simon's Sound right there and head for the sea buoy, it's, a, it's almost a 110 degree turn. Yeah, it's uh, red number 20 is yep. the buoy. And that is a, it's, it's, it's really, it's the sharpest really turn in the, in the channel, in the, in the route out to the open sea. And when he made that turn, um, I think she already, I had, I had some reports from some guys that were working on the tug at the time. And they, they told me that when they went to get the, get the ship away from the berth, she was already list. She was listing at that time. Mm. 
So they well, knew, she, she they, they, the guys kind of knew there was, yes, that exa is exactly right. And, you know, I know you, you, you looked at the report and we talked about that, uh, about the, uh, the reason it wound up that way. And, uh, you know, I, the first mate seems to be the guy that they're, they're going to go after. I, you know, I'm kind of mixed on that, on that whole thing, on the blame of this thing, because I don't know how much of that was, was, was a decision that he made and maybe how much of the decision he made, he was forced to make by a corporate decision. And I don't think that's part of the uh, NTSB report that was ever taken in the factor. And I, I think that's a, that's a pretty huge, considering the way shipping has become, in the business and a very, you know, when these ships go into port, it's not just, you know, they're, they're not just rolling up and saying, Hey, we need to take some cars off. This stuff is planned out months and months in advance with uh, every, every moving piece and part of it. The, uh, the pilots, the tugboats, the berth, the longshoremen, um, any supplies that the ship's going to be need. All this stuff is kind of, it's, it's, it's laid out and everything is thought through. And it's organized to happen on a timely basis. And when that when that goes awry, uh, the corporation that owns the ship is going to going to feel the brunt of that. And whether it's an extended stay in the port and having uh, to pay twice for services because you had one scheduled, then you could make your departure date or arrival date. So I don't. There were there were I think some other factors that went into it that probably weren't discussed in NTSB report. Oh, I, I think you're exactly right. I think I think it's well choreographed. I think uh, the lessons learned from the loss of Alfaro, for example, back in 2015, you know, the push by business to keep a schedule and to keep costs down to a minimum. I, th I think that's and then I talked about that in a video we did on on the NTSB report. I, I, I think you're exactly right. So you you're exactly right about the pilot, too. I think the pilot did a magnificent job getting that vessel out of the channel, preventing I mean, because you could have easily bottled up Brunswick and that would have been economically catastrophic for the entire port and region if you can't get any vessels in at the time. So the fact that they were able to keep the port open and actually open it up as quick as they did, I, I thought it was really just 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 amazing. They were able to do that. Uh, the. The salvage plan, because, you know, you mentioned the salvage plan and the impact that Oil Pollution Act of 1990 had on it. You know, the, the last major salvage, where, which got a, t uh, a lot of public attention, was that of the Costa Concordia in 2013 off the coast of Italy. That passenger vessel that sideswiped uh, Giglio, the island off the coast of Italy, and then came ashore and kind of rested on its side. Very similar to kind of Golden Ray in some ways. Uh, you know, you had this huge cruise ship on its side. It was kind of on a cliff almost. There was a big danger of it sliding off and everything. And, and they decided to do something called parabuckling where they rolled the vessel onto a platform and then raised her up. But they didn't do that with 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 Golden Ray. And, and I, I think, again, that's to me, and I agree with you entirely. I think there's going to be a big look back at that and see what why they did not do that and why they did not bring in a barge, roll her on there and, and refloat her because she didn't puncture her hull. It's not like she hit something and sank she she rolled over because of instability in the vessel and and i i think that big question how how has the local community kind of responded to that salvage operation you were talking about the lawsuits and everything what was the kind of response down there in brunswick when they announced that they're going to well, bring in a, they're going to bring in a big vessel and literally saw her into eight pieces i think originally very much like myself we were ex, you know once the the operation they had a really neat animation that showed the operation taking place and, uh, wow this is going to be something really really interesting to see or at least it was in my opinion and i think most of the community thought that as well however you know i didn't sit down and and start really thinking about the the after effect of you know taking a, a chain and sawing it through you know 4200 cars and uh, multiple fuel tanks uh some of which contain some of that really heavy bunker fuel um i didn't you know when when all that when when it was all kind of explained it sounded really great until we got into it and started to see some of the problems and it's like oh i don't know if i signed up for all this and uh, the one thing that really got the community here on saint simon's uh excited was when they had the the when they they got in and they think it was a a supply line that carried that bunker fuel from the tanks to the engine room, when it was severed, um, we had a pretty substantial release out here and it really oiled uh, the whole south end of the island. 
from the southern tip on on around east uh, uh, right up to one of the better better known resorts um you know heavy heavy black uh, fuel oil all over uh, the beach the rocks we saw some birds that they got into it it was a true mess and we're still seeing some residuals from that uh, down in the sand uh, a couple of the the environmental groups are here keeping an eye on it and they're still reporting that they're seeing aftermaths of or after effects of that where they can actually see the oil um, in some of some areas so um it uh while it, while it sounded good once you stop and, and really start to take into account uh, some other factors that, that's the thing i don't think the factors surrounding uh, this removal were really taken into account like they should have been uh, current the, the, the way the, the current moves here um, its proximity to the beaches and its proximity to um, sensitive areas uh, our birding areas uh, there's a spoil island out here that is very uh, uh, critical to to, to the uh, bird population where the, and it, it took a it took a heavy hit and I think it's it's areas like that and considerations like that that were kind of kind of maybe thought about but not really uh, given the, as much weight as they probably should have when they decided to, to, to move ahead the way they did. Yeah, I, I'm not going to lie. I've done a lot of studying on salvage operations. And I was really amazed that, that that was the choice they came up with because of the very simple fact, number one, you were not going to be able to get all the, and this is pre-January 1st, 2020, the switch over of fuel oil. So she had, the, like you said, the heavy bunker oil on board, it's almost impossible to get all the oil off the vessel. I mean, I mean, you're not, you, you know, it's like draining a tank. You're never going to be able to get the, the every last bit out of her. Plus, as you said, 4,000 cars, fuel in the cars. I, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, and then you're going to take it, you know, an anchor chain and saw through it. And always, I always use the analogy of taking a chainsaw and cutting through a, a tree. You're going to get sawdust everywhere. You know, that's going to be your debris. You're, you're never going to be able to cut through without debris going. Even if you build the coffer dam around it, you're still dumping into that water and you can't have a, a perfectly isolated coffer dam with that unless you drain it unless you physically drain i think you're going to be physically able to drain around it and 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 so that decision was really controversial in my opinion i i think that the decision by them to go ahead and and, and adopt that policy was extremely controversial and i think it's going to come back in the end to see that that this this was the wrong decision in my opinion i, I think they should have rolled the vessel and floated her out and everything. But again, I, I defer to you on that. You're right there on scene with it and you've seen it, especially the, the well, decision to cut both ends off at the same time and, and just allow. Yeah, well, let me tell you this. Her. We have seen car parts and pieces uh, down to the Cumberland Island National Seashore, which is mm -hmm. two islands south of us and as far north as Egg Island, which is three islands kind of wow. north of us. So the debris that was generated during the during the, the cutting process is still being moved around it's still uh being shifted you can imagine that some of that you know this the, the, the way the current moves so much in here it doesn't take long for pieces to uh, get covered up with sand uh, and then you get a storm and then they uncover uh, then they're back and they're moving around i think we're going to see probably uh, the after effects of, of this salvage operation for quite a while in this coastal area, um, stretching not only in the St. Simon Sound, but kind of radiating out for a while. And let's talk a little bit about you going out every day and, and, and documenting this. So what, what was a, a, a typical day like for you and in, in, in going out there? Because again, you didn't just go out there and, and take pictures. You, you're, you're, you developed a much more comprehensive view of this. I'm talking aerial drones. I'm, I'm talking a lot of imagery. You got to know a lot of the people out there and we, everything we did and and this you know doing this youtube show was certainly not the only thing i had going on uh, <laughs> i have a business that i operate here locally and that takes a good part of my time um so on my daily trips i would have to, sometimes they would be early it's whenever i could fit it into my schedule and i would i would tell people all the viewers you know what we're doing is it's just a snapshot into what's going on. That's all we're trying, you know, we're trying to just, just give you a little, a, this is, we were out, we were out in the water and this is what we saw while we were out there and we weren't out there for everything. Um, we, I'm sure we missed a ton of stuff, but what we did get, we thought was pretty good. And, and we would get back and kind of cut it up and try to get it 
you know, we tried to get a video out every evening and, and that took a tremendous amount of time, <laughs> as you can imagine, you know, cutting up a bunch of video, uh, but we were able to do it. Then I did a, a voiceover and get it loaded. And I tried to load everything up as high in as high definition as I could with YouTube so that the imagery was, was decent. And, um, well, Andy, you have, you, people, you, you do have a background in, in cinematography and film and you worked in Hollywood for years, right? Or is this something you just did on, on your own? <laughs> well, a little known fact, Doc, you're going to love this. I was actually, actually in a movie, uh, here that was filmed on St. Simon's, um, uh, a couple I did years not know ago. This. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, I think my left arm made it into the, <laughs> the movie. And that was, that was it. I, th that was it. Um, but no, I did not, I did not have any, I had no uh, film experience. I had uh, certainly no photography experience. I, I'm kind of involved with our local football team and I started doing that working on radio. So I had a, about nine years of experience um, doing a voice on radio. So I had that working for me, but that was it. Uh, and the rest of everything we did was simply the operation. The operation itself of, of the removal pretty much made what I did very easy because to me, there was always something exciting. And because we were out there as much as we were, it was very easy for us to go out and we could see something different, uh, see something that had been moved. Uh, something something going on that we didn't see the day before and it was re really easy for us to comment on that because we could see these changes happening um, you, you got to imagine that the, the salvage business um, it's, it's very fluid things change things evolve on almost probably an hourly basis so uh, we were able once we got out there and we could see things and uh, you know a lot of things that they said you know hey this is going to happen things didn't quite happen maybe the way they, they explained the way they were going to, they kind of happened the way they had to happen. And uh, so we were there and we, and we were fortunate. We were able to get uh, a good bit of it. I, you know, one of the things I always noticed from your videos, uh, Andy was, was at times I could tell you were getting dissatisfied with the way the salvage was going, but you always maintain such a professionalism and, and, and really you treated the guys who were doing the salvage operation with so much respect. I think that's always the issue. You, you know, you always talked about how dangerous that was the job they were doing, you know, you separated the two and that was a very, I, I think that was great. I, I think that was, that was really, you know, you, you're not blaming them for what they're, they're doing a job. The, and, and, the and people doing, they assembled here, doc, to do this job, to do this work. were definitely some of the best in the world at what they did. Uh, and there were there's so many facets of the operation and to to be a great welder i just let's use a welder and the, the amount of training that you have to uh, accomplish uh, and go through to become a come a welder and understanding metals and and all those kind of things take that all that knowledge and then take the necessary sea experience that you have to to be able to operate under harsh conditions out in the weather uh, on moving platforms and being able to do that is those those guys are, are true specialists and, and it, that, it was like that across the board um, everybody that worked on this pro project was uh, extreme professionals and and uh, it was just it was a pleasure to watch them work uh, I'm, I will say that sometimes the work that they were doing you know wherever that was coming from whoever was directing it sometimes I questioned um, <laughs> But I, you know, I, I, a little bit. That's kind of your job, and a little bit you kind of question authority. So yeah, uh, some of it, uh, some of it, we 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 were yes, we were dissatisfied with some of it. It got a little frustrating at times. No, but but again, I, I think you always maintain that professional. It's very funny you mentioned about broadcasting with with football. I do I do the same thing in my college with lacrosse. I've been doing it for nine years now, and it actually helps me a lot in what I do with this you use you keep using the pronoun we so who else is involved with it you are the face we, we get to hear you and see you all the time but i have a feeling there's some people behind the well, scenes the, the other the other star of, my, of the whole process was my boat <laughs> and um you know people do we, love the menorcan mullet I, I will say that they do and, love the boat you know it's it's I, I was i was nothing without without the boat the boat was performed pretty much flawlessly throughout the whole operation and uh, just a plug here to, to the Parker boat folks. It was uh, a great vessel. It was a 21 foot uh, uh, pilot house boat, which, which provided me a little uh, on some, some of the nights that we were out there trying to get shots of, of uh, maybe the chain breaking through 
if there were if we if we had the opportunity to get out at nighttime we could do that and be able to place to have a place to stay in out of the weather um the boat was a blessing to have and we we couldn't have done it without her she uh so she is definitely a part of the team she i mean she's a beautiful boat she, she really is uh and 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 I, I love boats i have my own boat myself so you know you you adopt a a, a persona to them and and it, it, it's a physical nature to them i Real quick, because I know if I didn't ask this question, people would ding me on it. Menorcan Mullet, how'd you get the name for the boat? Names for boats are always very important. How'd, how'd you come up well, with the actually, name? I actually did a, did a, um, a one video on it. Um, my heritage is uh, Menorcan. Uh, the Menorcans came to the east coast of Florida uh, very early on. when it was, um, And they came over as part of a Spanish land grant uh, to a place that they actually named um, uh, it's called New Smyrna uh, to a plantation there uh, as indentured servants, and uh, the plantation failed after about ten years, and that contingency was left in the Florida wilderness by the the, the folks that came to start that plantation. They said, "Hey, you guys are free. Have a good day." And that contingency walked from uh, New Smyrna to the city of St. Augustine. And I'm, if you're familiar with the city of St. Augustine in Florida, the nation's oldest city it, at the time, it was behind the gates. It was still a city up, just off from the big fort there and behind the gates. And basically they walked up and knocked on the door and they were accepted into the city of St. Augustine. And that's how the, the Menorcan heritage is, is uh, most well known for the city of St. Augustine, but they originally started in New Smyrna. That's a great background. So I always, always love when people know their heritage, you know, the story to me bring, brings that out quite a bit in there. Let, let's talk a little bit about your documentation out there. I, I mean, I got to imagine there are some videos you did that maybe are your favorite or, or the ones that kind of last with you the most when you were, you were out there. I mean, again, you, you were consistent. I mean, except for when you got sick there for a brief time, you were out there every day, pretty much documenting it. And, you know, I'm always, I have a favorite video that I've done that I think is one of my favorites, but I'm interested in yours. What, what do you think was the one? And obviously sometimes it's not the best because it, it, it reveals information that we don't always like. May 14th, uh, the day that they had the big fire. Um, and I think that, and it just so happened, it was on a Friday afternoon that it happened. I had a, a break in my schedule and I was actually coming back from the mainland across the causeway. And I could see a little bit of smoke coming off of the ship. And I actually called um, my contact over, over at the Unified Command to ask them what was going on. And at the time, they were unaware that that was developing the way it was. And So wait a minute. So, wait a minute. Uh, so, we, so you, you informed the Unified Command that the fire was going on the vessel? My particular contact, yes, had not been made aware okay. that there was, a, there was an incident going on. <laughs> I'm not saying that the entire unified command did not know. My guy at the time did not okay. know the, the guy that, that, that I made, that I, all my contact was through. And uh, so we were able to get out there pretty early and uh, document that the whole fire that, that took place. And, and really, and that changed so much of the salvage operation after that fire because they had to go into a, a break. The, the ship itself had to be inspected. Uh, the lifting points had to be inspected. In some places, they had to be uh, modified and uh, strengthened. Um, and then the cars that were involved in the fire, you know, that uh, it made the, the most horrible mess that was on the water. And, you know, even the, when we were out, you know, the last few cuts, you would still see pieces of remnants of that fire from Part plastic and uh, car insulation and things like that that you would still find on the water, and that that's probably the the biggest the, the most memorable part of this whole event to me was uh, was that day May the fourteenth. Yeah, and I was getting toward the end. I mean, they were getting their final cuts in, and uh, I think they're getting ready to lift at that point. They had the VB one thousand all hooked up on it. And uh, I do remember your reports on that, and, and it was quite uh, uh, quite stark at the time. And the and the fire was 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 bad. They were spraying through the hull. And, and you really start to see that you, you've also had scientists out with you. You've brought a lot of people out to the site too. And, you know, one of the ones I remember, I remember seeing a report, I think it was by the Jacksonville TV station down there 
one of the Jacksonville had uh, did a report with you and, and literally you guys were just fishing pieces of, of plastic and burnt material out. What's been your relationship with, with scientists, with, with professionals who are trying to document the, the pollution that's going on down there in the sound? I'd ha- I had many people that contacted me about wanting to want to take a ride out on the boat. And uh, if, if I was able to do that, if it worked in the schedule, I didn't have any problem because I'm usually I'm out there by myself. I had no, no problem at all with having uh, other people on the boat. Um, and we, some people, you know, wanted to come out and just take a look. And then some people wanted to come out and, you know, take some water samples and things like that. And I didn't mind having them on the boat. Um, they, they didn't interfere with my operation and I didn't interfere with them. So, uh, I think, uh, I, if I'm playing a part in the helping, the helping people out, maybe understand this accident a little bit better. Um, that's great. Um, I, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to put myself into a position to, uh, be the environmental um, bulldog of, of this, of this whole operation. That was certainly not my intent. If it came off that way, well, it came off that way because people were interested in either to ride out there and I said, get on the boat, come on. No, I, I think you were able to maintain your detachment. I mean, you, you again, I, I think one of the, the interesting things, you know, one of the great things about YouTube is, is the fact that you can get subject matter experts and you're a subject matter expert. You're right there. You've seen this, uh, this event evolve in front of you and you've, you've been able to document it. Uh, I want to talk about the drone footage. I, I think you got some amazing images there. Is that your drone? Are you running the drone when you're doing that? I am. I'm a, I'm a, a one Oh, I'm, I'm also a private pilot and uh, one of, I have my one Oh seven ticket for drone flight. And early on, um, you know, there's a distinction between recreational drone flight and commercial or one Oh seven. It's two different, two different parts. Uh, that you kind of follow two different rules. And as a 107 pilot, I'm actually granted other privileges that a recreational droner might not be granted because I have training and understand airspace and that kind of thing. And early on, I was actually able to fly at the site and then that stopped. Um, I don't, I'm still, I I don't know why that stopped. Um, It was kind of, it was, it's disappointing to me that uh, that um, that side of the operation felt it was necessary to, to shut down all the drone flights, yet they were still allowing drone flights from the contractors out there. Um, that said, uh, we did we did were able to once they got out of that exclusion zone, um, we were able to, to to really get some pretty good footage, and uh, I was very proud of some of the stuff that we put out. And it's there on YouTube for anybody to go and see. And um, the, the footage that we did get was, was kind of, when you look at it and then understand the scale of what you're looking at, you can understand this accident a lot better uh, as far as the magnitude of what, it, what this actually was. Oh, I think those visuals you did uh, of some of this is just amazing. I, I mean, again, when you see those cuts and you see that lift and you see those decks and, and the, the vehicles in them, you, you start to get an appreciation for it. The scale is, 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 is sometimes, you know, until you see the size of the cars in there, then you realize the scale. And, and again, we forget how big these ships are and, and they're massive vessels and, and the VB 1000 out there doing that lift is, is it, engineering wise, is just incredible. I mean, it's just, it, it's an insane amount of engineering that goes into that. And I go back to what you were talking about with the welders, being able to put those hard points on there and be able to lift from points that didn't exist previously. The, the amount of strain and stresses just, uh, mind-boggling in many ways yep you know that machine uh the vb was it was never designed uh to actually do ship salvage it's it's life started uh, as uh a, for for work in the oil field for working on oil heads uh drill rigs lifting doing heavy lifting off the bottom um in a straight up and down kind of manner and uh, the, the forces that were put on, just to tell you how well that thing was, the forces that were put onto that were at sometimes at a 45 de- degree angle into that superstructure. And uh, that's got to be a, just a tremendous load for, you know, I, I, do a, I do a little bit of crane work in my job. I understand side loading. I understand the limitations of side loading. And that whole operation with, uh, with some of the cutting that they did on it 
was was pretty impressive that was able to to kind of withstand the rigors uh, and the it, and it was a violent it was a violent operation when you got in there kind of close and you can see that from some of our our video and photography it was it was it was a violent that that chain tearing and it was wasn't cutting it was ripping and tearing its way through that ship under tremendous amounts of tension and uh, when you see that happening and you i mean at nighttime we could see sparks coming off of it so yeah, yeah I, it was pretty impressive i mean they're using an anchor chain so you're not using you know diamond tip saw to, to cut through there and, and like you said it, it would pop in stress and and it wasn't a smooth cutting operation by any means I and mean, even the lifting operation i would argue wasn't smooth i mean you had dynamic loads in there you had car shifting weight shifting all the time uh it was you know it was, it was amazing that nothing further bad happened beyond the the, the large fire yeah. that you mentioned that happened to our, to our knowledge there were no serious injuries that occurred out on the the, the entire project uh and that is that's that's something that's something i think is worth mentioning that they were uh, the guys that were out there were able to get that job done without any serious injury and i want to ask you i mean because the, the ntsb report came out and and you know the captain of the port the coast guard has been documenting and, and and running this how how do you feel that you know is is the port of brunswick safe to operate right now have they taken lessons from the golden ray incorporated them into future vessels or you know one of my concerns i've had is is that have we not taken the lesson from the golden ray to heart to, so that in the future we're not going to have another accident like this that could be much worse that involves loss of life closing the port for for brunswick you know um, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, there are fire hydrants that are kind of along um, the area out there at the port. And I wonder now, because they wouldn't take on water in the port to ballast with because of its the condition of the silty water and the expense it takes to put that on, how cheap would it have been the night before to turn on to turn on a pumping system and pull some of the uh, some of the water out of that system to ballast the ship before it left, would that have made a difference? Yeah, and how if if it would, how cheap would it have been to buy that buy that water to make that make the ship uh, more stable for its for its uh, passage out? Uh, and again, that's Monday morning quarterback and something, but you know it's makes you wonder. It really really does. Yeah, because, because like you said, you know, you wonder if vessels are leaving every day from Brunswick, if, if they're leaving in the, you know, a, a, a poor stability situation, kind of like Golden Ray was and everything. So obviously we're still watching the cleanup. It, it's not done yet by any means, even though most of the, the vessel has been removed now from the area, you still have a lot of cleanup. So what's next for, for, for the Menorcan mullet here? What, what, what's uh, your plan going forward? Obviously we want to get the end of the salvage, but well, we're going to, finish finish up the cleanup here that we've got on and then i think the channel we're, we're going to try to try to keep uh the channel kind of centered around uh, a nautical thing with the boat uh, maybe make some trips uh, that'll include the boat um, maybe do some port trips try to catch uh some of the port port activities that take take uh place in brunswick and just kind of kind of go from there and, and see if we can kind of evolve the channel uh, with what maybe the viewers want to see. Um, I think that would be the big thing that we, if we could do that and still have the ability to maintain interest and uh, uh, a, a good following, we're going to keep doing it. What, what have you learned from the whole experience? Obviously this has been a, a changing event for you. I mean, you went from, you know, a, a, a captain of a boat, you know, you're out there fishing and, and doing other jobs and everything like that to now you, you are a YouTube influencer. You know, I think the biggest thing that I take away from this whole incident is how the decisions of one, one responsible party can affect, how they can affect so many so quickly. And it's not only individual and people, but uh, environmental uh, concerns, um, they've got to play into that. And when you start to think about the impacts that may still may still be out there that we still may be waiting to see uh, happen and unfold. Uh, well, I don't think we've seen the end of the golden ray yet. I, I don't. And, and, you know, I want to compliment you on something else too, Andy, and you mentioned this earlier. I, I think one of the things about the shipping industry, and again, I have a background in shipping is, is the shipping industry does not like to talk. They're, they're very close mind, the closed mouth. 
they they don't like public. They, they every time a camera gets thrown in their face, they don't like it because they're worried about the neg- negative press. But I think one of the things that you've done very well is really unmask that. I mean, you're showing what's going on there. And, and again, your future for the for the channel, I think, is great too. You know, documenting a port, what goes in, we don't see it. I mean, we really don't. You know, we we we're, we're shocked by what's happening right now off LA and Long Beach with the pileup of, of vessels. But you know, again, most people don't realize how important the Port of Brunswick is for bringing in vehicles, for bulk material, for for moving goods. And you know, it's so detached from our common nature we take for granted and then when all of a sudden an accident like golden ray happens or the the oil pipeline off the coast of la and long beach people wake up to this and i and i think one of the you know if there's a positive thing to come out of this is is the attention that you're directing on this you know and if you're documenting ships coming in and out you know you're talking to people i i think that's a great thing to do because again how many people in the port of georgia really realize that they're a major seafaring you know Port. You know, they have they have major trade coming in and out of them. Savannah is becoming one of the biggest ports in the United States. It's going to be the largest port in the southeast. And, and, and really, a lot of economy is going to be derived from this. You know, you, you see it with fishing. You see it with with uh, 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 tourism down in that area. And, you know, I got a feeling there'll be people coming down for 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 tour rides on the Menorcan mullet for years to come after having seen uh, your videos. Well, um you know, you never, you never know, but I, I got to tell you, we, we, we have enjoyed what we've been doing. We wouldn't be doing it if we didn't enjoy this. And uh, because to be honest with you, we're not, we're certainly not getting rich from YouTube. Um, it's, but it has given me a great deal of personal satisfaction uh, just to kind of bring the story out to people. And not only are people are watching now, but you don't know years down the line, maybe, maybe this, series will will have an influence on on decisions should there be another accident will will it cause uh, pause for people to take in other considerations you know what what is the current there how's it going to affect how, uh, what's its proximity to uh, very sensitive uh, estuary like areas um, and maybe maybe that'll be the legacy of what I've done I don't know but uh, we've we've certainly enjoyed it and I gotta tell you uh, Finding your channel and discovering you has been uh, been very very enlightening to me as well. And I got to tell you, um, I, you know, you're the guy. You're the guy that got my Christmas shopping done early because you know, it was months <laughs> ago, you said container ships, container shipping is going to become a problem, people. And I listened to you and, and uh, yeah, thank you. Certainly. Thank you for that. I, I just wish my wife had listened to me because my, my birthday <laughs> present is stuck on a ship somewhere because uh, my birthday is <laughs> in October and I didn't get it because it's still shipping. So she, she, you listen, my wife did not listen. So I'm happy to hear that. And I, I, I truly, I truly do. I'm not lying at all. When I sit there and tell you that people are going to be looking at your videos for years to come, it is a master class in Marine salvage that when a future vessel goes down, you know, Everybody in Marine Salvage understand this process, but public entities don't. And when they announce, listen, we're going to do this salvage by slicing this vessel in pieces. Now they have video documentation where they can look at and say, well, wait a minute, you're going to do that here. But look at what happened in, you know, St. Simon Sound back in 2020 and 2021. Do we really want to have that here? Because sometimes, again, shipping industry is behind this veil. We don't see it. We see the vessels going in and out from Jekyll Island, but we don't understand what exactly is going right. on. And I think one of the things hey, you did. I don't, so I don't want to be the guy that says law, large section salvage is, is should be, should be cast out. It, it very well may have great applications uh, to certain, certain situations um, here in ours. Maybe we should have looked at it a little closer before, before we got involved with it. That's all. That's, that's all I'm saying. No, I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, if this was an empty tanker, I mean, it's a different situation than a loaded car carrier. And I, I, again, I, I think what you did is, is again, capture something that for a long time is, is going to be there. I think people are going to be looking at this for a long time. And I think you see that on your channel where people go back, discover the channel, and then can follow the entire evolution of this for years to come. And, and, and again, I, I strongly recommend you guys all go to the Menorcan mullet, subscribe to it, take a look. Andy's got a great database of, of videos in there that you can follow from the very beginning through the evolution and, and see how this salvage 
has become, and, and, you know, you know, as well as I do, you become the subject matter expert, Pete, you know, you get the calls from the news agencies who want to talk to you. And it, it, you, if you're like me, it's weird. All of a sudden people are calling you and asking your opinion of things. It's like, okay, well, here it is. This, I'll go, this is what I think. Yeah. That's, <laughs> you know, all I can say, you know, it's, this is what we're seeing out here. And that's, that's been the big thing. This, you know, we're, we're just trying to, trying to, let people know what we see you know it's a little snapshot again a snapshot into the day of what we're seeing going on with the operation well and i think that's what, makes, what we did i think that's what makes channels like yours mine very you know we we don't try to talk more than what we know we we explain things to the best of our knowledge give our opinion on it and when we state what our opinion is and we may be right maybe wrong but this is what we're seeing and and go with it any any last things you want to add on this before we uh sign off well um i will say this that the uh, you know the golden ray cleanup continues and hopefully things rebound as quickly as uh, they occurred and we'll see um, concerns we have uh, dissipate through uh, whether it be debris or uh, all that may still be kind of lingering around or trapped in somewhere but um, hopefully those those issues will will quickly dissipate and we'll continue to see uh, more and more people come into the area and enjoy the natural beauty that is uh, coastal Georgia, St. Simons, and Brunswick area. Well, Captain Andy Jones, I appreciate you taking the time, spending almost an hour with us on, on what's going on with shipping to talk about the situation with the Golden Ray down there in St. Simons. To, to all my subscribers, please go over to Menorcan Mullet, subscribe, watch Andy's videos, comment. Do what you can, and if you get down to uh, 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 St. Simon's, you know, you know, go ahead, go for a fishing trip with Andy. It, uh, I'm sure he would, he would love to have you out there to go fishing with him and and, and enjoy it. Uh, Andy, thank you again, sir. I, I appreciate you taking the time and being with us today. And we, and myself especially, my heart and thoughts go to everybody in, in Brunswick, Georgia, for the cleanup and for what they have had to go through with this. I, I think no one, no community deserves this, what, what has happened. And I just hope that a element of stability and, and kind of getting back to the way things were prior to the wreck can, can happen back down there in St. Simons. Sal, we certainly appreciate you for your time and, and really appreciate your kind words. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate it.